Jesus is not coming back. The second coming that's in the like, Christian movies and a lot of people are preaching in their churches where Jesus Christ is coming back as a single person again and is going to basically wreck you. He's going to knock over all these kingdoms, is going to be turmoil, people are going to get sucked out of their shoes. That's not going to happen. That is a misinterpretation of the Bible. That's not what scripture is pointing towards. That's what we said recently in a short video and some people liked it and some people didn't. And I would say the pushback to that, I could sum it up or put it in a little basket of, you gotta read the Bible, man. You're just saying that, but we that's not what the Bible says. So careful what you wish for. I, it's important to read the Bible. That's exactly why we're gonna do it right now. I wanna show in this video that the idea of the second coming being a warlike event that establishes Jesus Christ as the literal ruler of the earth is not what the scripture says. But first, before we go there, I want to set up the context because I think how we interpret the second coming is influenced by our beliefs about who Jesus is. What kind of person is he? What message does he have? And I think it also is influenced by our perception of what is Jesus against? There's a general acceptance that Jesus came to fight evil. But what is evil? We, we know the specific forms of it. You know, if oh, you murdered someone, that's evil. You stole from someone, that's evil. What is at the root of all those things? It's the love of dominion. It is dominance and using other people against their will. You kill someone, it's you're taking their life. That's supposed to be theirs. You steal from someone, it's taking their things and using them for yourself. Jesus does not want to dominate anyone. He doesn't want to rule anyone against their will. I mean, he says it. You don't have to take my word for it. He's talking to his disciples about greatness and power, and he says, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Why does Jesus want to not be served, but to serve? And then all of a sudden he does this 180 in his second coming and says, I want to conquer and subjugate everyone. Those are two pretty different things. He just flip-flopped like that. I know you can pick and choose quotes. You can cherry pick things out of the Bible to say, look, this is what it says when it also says other things. But I do want to say there are two places where Jesus pretty explicitly tells us what he's about and what it's all about. This is the time when they say, hey, Jesus, what is the most important thing? Uh, how, what's the biggest deal out of everything? And he tells you, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Love God. And then he puts this in there. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. The law being the books of Moses, the prophets being the prophetic word. All this is about loving God and loving the neighbor. What, what is there of repentance in waiting for Jesus to come and strike the earth? What is there of love in that? The, the thing he's commanding us to do, how does that belief that Jesus Christ is coming back down this time to really rule, what does that have to do with loving God and loving the neighbor? And next, Jesus tells his disciples how they will be recognized as followers of him. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is the branding of Christians. This is how they're gonna be able to tell, oh, that's, that's a disciple of Jesus. Love, that you have love for one another. So the true second coming has to hang on love of God and love of neighbor and be able to show people you love one another, that's why you're Christians. So since we have that established, now I want to go through and show how the Bible points toward a second coming that takes place within each of us individually and has been taking place since the time of Jesus. Here's how we're going to go through it. We're first going to look at how the first coming didn't go the way people thought it was going to go. Then we're going to look at how the language of prophecy in the Bible is unavoidably symbolic. Then we're going to look at how Jesus used that same symbolic language in the prophecies that he gave. And finally, we're going to learn what coming in the clouds really means. One of the reasons that we can tell that people are getting the prophecies of the second coming of Jesus wrong 
is that we already did this. This being people already got the prophecies about Jesus wrong in the first coming. There was all this stuff in the Old Testament saying there's gonna be this Messiah and people read those and because of how they literally sounded, they had this notion about what Jesus was gonna do when he came and they got it wrong. It wasn't what he was really here to do and they got it wrong in the exact same way that we're getting this wrong now. So if you look at the Old Testament prophecies and then look at the actual life Jesus lived, we don't have to be making this mistake again. You can see the parallels, they're obvious. In Micah 5, it says in verse two, there's a heading here that says, the coming Messiah. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ. But you, Bethlehem Ephrath, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Yes, Jesus did come out of Bethlehem. No, he did not rule Israel. In fact, when people tried to make him the ruler of Israel, because people had seen these prophecies and thought, he's gonna be the, he's gonna be the king of Israel. They took him at one point in the New Testament and tried to make him king, and he ran away. He got out of there. He's like, I'm gonna go up on this mountain by myself because even though it says right there, read your Bible, it says right there, he's gonna be the king of Israel. That wasn't the kind of king he was gonna be. He wasn't gonna be a literal king of Israel. He wasn't gonna rule in a literal sense. And then in Zechariah, there's this extensive prophecy about the effect Jesus is gonna have on war. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you again a guy who never becomes king is being called the king. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Yeah, he did do that. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That never happened. If you were back then reading that with the same mindset that people read the coming of Jesus in the second instance today, you would say, oh, well, he's gonna have a kingdom. It's gonna go from this river to this river, and there's gonna be no more war. None of that happened when Jesus came. None of that happened. That was not what Jesus was here to do, even though it seemed like it in the prophecies, because the prophecies are talking about spiritual things using natural language. This is always how prophecies go. They knew a Messiah was coming, and they thought, well, because of what it says here, taken hyper-literally, we know who he's gonna be and what he's gonna do. But when he actually came, he did not do that, and a lot of people got that wrong. Even the people who had lived with him, been around him longer than anyone. Listen to this. When two of Jesus' disciples are walking the road to Emmaus with him, this is after he was already crucified, this is when he comes back from the dead and they don't know that they're walking with him. And listen to what they say about how the whole Jesus thing went. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They were saying to Jesus, ah, we thought he was gonna be the Messiah who was gonna redeem Israel, and they didn't think he did it because their expectations of what that would consist of were wrong because they had taken the biblical prophecies literally. They thought redemption was political rule. It was an upheaval of the order of the Romans and everything that's going on. They did not understand that it was a spiritual upheaval that Jesus was going for. They didn't even get that he had succeeded, even after they had been with him the whole time. So are we making those same mistakes and clinging to these bizarre, literal interpretations of the prophecies about the second coming. So I say that it's bizarre to interpret biblical prophecies literally because if you go look at them, there's no other way to do it, especially ones that already came to pass because they were about Jesus. Let me show you a couple of places in Isaiah where you just can't read this without admitting this is not talking about what it literally says. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Okay, that already happened. Great. It says after that, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is not what his name was. His name was Jesus. Curds and honey he shall eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. Maybe he had curds and honey, it doesn't say. But I know he didn't do this if you just go down two verses to 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt. Do you remember that story? 
Jesus and the fly when he whistles. And for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, they will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on all thorns and in all pastures. You know, like all the, the bees and the flies covered everything when Jesus came. It's not talking about bees. It's not talking about flies. It's talking about something more important than that. That's how biblical prophecies are. They are unavoidably symbolic. But it's not just prophecies about Jesus that use this undeniably symbolic language. Jesus prophesies in it too. There's two modes, there's two Jesus modes. You could very clearly, when he's out there interacting, asking people questions, even when he's preaching to people, he has a certain voice that he uses, a certain tone, that he, a certain verbiage that he uses. When he starts to prophesy, it's different. The whole vibe is different. And he says things in those prophecies that we know are not gonna happen, could not happen literally. Here's only just one example. This is a lot of people take this prophecy to be about the second coming. First of all, in Matthew 24, 28, he's giving this, this prophecy about what, what's gonna happen. In 28 he says, for wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will gather together. Why is that newsworthy? You know, especially in light of what's about to come where we're talking about the entire reshaping of the solar system. Why is he talking about literal eagles around a carcass or is this some kind of commentary on the kinds of people that are gonna be affected by this? 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven and the power of the heavens will be shaken. The stars are gonna fall from heaven. Do you think he literally means that? Where are the stars gonna to fall to? What's falling to a star? Which way does it go? Stars are many times the size of the earth. We're talking about obliteration. He means something else. He's talking about something spiritual, just like all the prophecies in the Old Testament. We're talking about something spiritual. So if Jesus uses this symbolic language of prophecy. And that's something that happens all throughout scripture, including the prophecies about the next coming of Christ. What are those prophecies about? What are the symbol? What do the symbols mean in there? Because I'm not trying to say there's no second coming. Obviously something is going to happen. And this was something that was really important in the way it was talked about. I'm just going to go into one of the symbols today. And it has to, the, the, I think the thing that is most misunderstood and that confuses people the most is what the clouds are in prophecies. Because it says that Jesus is coming, he'll be coming in the clouds of heaven. We'll be caught up into the clouds with him. Just about every one of these prophecies has something about clouds. But are we talking about vaporized H2O? If he's coming in the clouds, was he like what? Like he was in outer space before? Why do clouds matter? Does it matter if it's an overcast day when Jesus comes back? Clouds throughout scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, have to do with divine communication. I'll give you a couple examples. Exodus 24, God calls to Moses out of the midst of a cloud. Numbers 11, the Lord's spirit comes down from a cloud to communicate with Moses. Always there's these clouds and God is talking to you out of the clouds. Deuteronomy 5.22, again, God speaks from the midst of a cloud. And the clouds seem to do things that clouds shouldn't be able to do. And they, they give God the ability to do things. In Deuteronomy 33, he's riding on the clouds. In Psalm 57, it says his truth reaches unto the clouds. Like the clouds are some kind of capstone for the truth of God. What do the clouds stand for? What, what does God use to communicate? What is it that you know what you know about God from? This is how God communicates. I would say it's not the only way, but it is the most widespread way in the world that people are learning about God. Where's the power of God? Like how is God changing the world? Doing it through what? Where, how do you know everything you know about Jesus? How did it touch your heart? It came from this, the scripture, the revelation. When Jesus was walking on that road, to Emmaus with the disciples. The moment that was powerful to them, that really showed him that he had risen, was when he opened up the scriptures and showed them all the how the entire thing was about him. The second coming of Jesus Christ 
The kingdom of heaven is within you. The second coming of Jesus Christ is that coming in each heart and in each mind, and it comes through the clouds. It comes through what you learn about him from his word. And when that takes hold and comes to life in you, there, the second coming has happened millions and millions of times, and it's happening right now every time somebody has those stories of Jesus in the word change who they are and they start to live a life like Jesus lived. Then Jesus lives inside of you and you brought a little bit of him back into the world. Jesus is going to come again in the clouds by us getting to know who he is and learning how to live by that through more and more understanding what the scripture is actually talking about. Because after all, he's the word made flesh. So there's all kinds of good reasons from the Bible to say, no, Jesus is not coming back like a number of Christians think he's coming back. But the biggest reason is that for Jesus Christ to come back to the earth as a conquering king and start ruling over everybody and reset the geopolitical order, he would be entirely changing everything about who he is, the character that he had in the first coming and the mission that he was on. Everything we know about Jesus says that he, he wasn't interested in that. Luke 17, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Everything Jesus taught was about establishing the kingdom of God within you. Why, if he's just going to come back down and start to tell everyone what to do and rule the world, why do you need to learn about loving one another as I have loved you and turning the other cheek and all that. What, what does it matter? Is Christianity about making moral progress? Is it about regeneration? Is it about repentance? Or isn't it? Everything Jesus did in the world was to try to get us to live good lives. That's the kingdom of heaven he was trying to establish in us. That's what his first coming was all about. Why wouldn't it be that the second coming is when we do establish that kingdom of heaven inside us and inside each person the spirit of god shines out the second coming of jesus christ is going to be better than people think it's going to be because it's going to be in the heart and mind of everyone you think about what the world could be like if everybody had jesus ruling inside them that's going to change the world in a way that even even jesus coming back and and sitting on a throne would and the cool thing is you don't have to wait for that second coming. You don't have to study the signs and see when is he going to come back. Is it... Whenever you want. Whenever you want. You open up your heart, live by the teachings that Jesus gave us. Second coming can, can start today.